So, uh, well, I also would like to thank Diana and Sini and everybody who made this possible because it's certainly a nice change of pace when we have a meeting that is as stimulating as this one and the occasion is not some scheduled conference or other dreadful event, but actually a nice social gathering honoring uh, one of our dearest friends and colleagues. So, uh, Paul asked me whether I consider myself to be a philosopher. The answer is no. Uh, do I consider myself to be a historian? The answer is not really. Uh, so I'm standing here as a scientist, and what I'm trying to provide is sort of a symmetry uh, to what Sharon was uh, saying earlier, uh, namely how history can really become more and more part of the scientific endeavor, and I'm trying to look at that also from the scientific perspective of how essential it is to incorporate historical reflection into what we are doing. Now this talk is sort of a continuation of uh, what Jürgen set up because we're working together as you might have seen on several uh, areas in the context of the Anthropocene and uh, in enlarging evolutionary theory and applying it to knowledge evolution. So the Anthropocene, uh, a time for fools, knowledge in the Anthropocene. This is in uh, light of uh, what am I doing here? Okay, this, the tradition of moving forward. The fool, of course, is a very important figure in Western literature and theater, uh, and also in the context of science, and here's an eclectic collection of such fools. But what I'm referring to here is a quote by Schrodinger uh, in the preface of his seminal book, What is Life? because it in a way reflects what is needed today, and you might immediately recognize why this certainly applies to Jed. Uh, I can I read it to you because it's that important. I can see no other escape from this dilemma, lest our true aim be lost forever, that some of us should venture to embark on a synthesis of facts and theories, albeit with second-hand and incomplete knowledge of some of them and at the risk of making fools of ourselves. Why is that important? And how did this actually connect uh, to JET and my relationship to JET? Which uh, in earnest started about roughly 12 or 13 years ago uh, when JET set something in motion, namely a collaboration here at Caltech between myself and the late Eric Davidson. Uh, and there you have Eric in his office where I spent many, many hours uh, working with him and uh, an equal amount of hours having dinners with Jed. Uh, and the subject of those dinners uh, was far ranging, but there's a common theme. Of course, we talked about um, events of the day. We complained, as you might expect, about the state of the profession and about many of you in the room. Uh, and, uh, but we, there was an undercurrent, an uneasiness about the loss of something more fundamental, and that is sort of the loss of what we would call the enlightenment values. And the question is what to do about it and what role science has to play in that endeavor and especially also what uh, role sort of a critical historical analysis or epistemology, the way uh, uh, Don just uh, introduced it, really plays in that. This is just sort of uh, a, a flow chart of what happened here at Caltech over the last 10 years. So Jed set it up between Eric and me, and we all became very fast friends. Um, Eric and I then produced uh, a paper that, you know, the way uh, Niles sort of uh, interpreted uh, Jed's praise was not all that bad, according to his standards. It was a very technical paper uh, about an ongoing, uh, very complex experiment uh, that started in the middle of the 19th century and continued to the middle of the 20th century and was sort of foundational in trying to figure out how we interpret development as well as evolution. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, it reconstructs that experiment in great detail. It's a historical paper. But uh, with the necessary supplies of both uh, uh, bourbon and wine, wine more with Jed, bourbon more with Eric, um, and this is 120 proof, so this is what biologists drink, you know. Uh, 
uh, it triggered uh, into uh, there's sort of a flowchart of Eric's work, which is foundational uh, for our understanding of gene regulatory network and what they do in development and evolution. So we contributed to that. But out of that discussion, 10-year discussion, uh, a lot of the stimulations for a paper that Jürgen and I produced on that extended evolution conceptual framework really emerged. So whatever craziness we produced, blame Chad. That's the message here. Now, where does this go into the future? Uh, and how does it connect to the Anthropocene? Uh, there are actually sort of two dimensions of knowledge in the Anthropocene that we need to uh, appreciate here. One is, and this is what Jürgen talked about at length here, what kind of knowledge do we need to understand the Anthropocene? But there is a second set of questions, and you might realize it might be even more urgent, and this is what kind of knowledge do we need to survive the Anthropocene? And that brings us back to those many years of uh, conversations with Jed about the uneasiness of the loss of the Enlightenment, in a way, because what we have to face as a main challenge in order to address the question of survival in the Anthropocene has, of course, to do uh, with the fact, and Jürgen alluded to, that that was one of the conclusions that Jed made in that paper about climate change, that we need to make decisions fast and with incomplete knowledge. Uh, and we don't really have a framework of how to do that right. So what can we learn, for instance, and how important is the history of knowledge for that endeavor? And now we're getting more uneasy. What, uh, how can we accomplish more global coordination uh, in an increasingly fragmented world? And that, of course, is reflected in uh, the other reality that even within our domain, there is an increasing fragmentation uh, within academic and scientific fields, even though we would need more integration. Hence the importance of Schrodinger, hence the importance of fools, hence we should all dress up as fools and behave like them. Okay, so what I want, to, I want to briefly show you two ways of how we can get at both of those questions. So the first one is, how do we actually begin to understand the Anthropocene from the perspective of extended evolutionary theory? So this is a puzzle. Again, I'm not entertaining answers here. What do all those systems have in common? Anything from a chemical hypercycle uh, to an electric grid and everything in between. Those all represent major transitions in energy regimes that have uh, emerged over the last 3.5 billion years of evolution on that planet. So if faced with those very different systems, of course the question then is how do we understand what that really is and is there an under, a fundamental underlying theory that allows us to understand transformations in complex systems. And there is. And there are, uh, there's the one that we propose, namely evolution, clearly. They are all the product of evolution, but what kind of evolutionary theory? And as Jürgen already explained, you need to be a little more sophisticated than traditional evolutionary theory and really appreciate the role of regulatory systems and their active construction of their niches, which gives you two types of feedbacks and dynamics that we call externalization and internalization. And there's already uh, a more long-standing concept within evolutionary theory, namely the concept of major transitions. Now, that concept has been mainly descriptive or phenomenological. Whenever you would bring up a concept like that with Eric Davidson, he would basically start screaming at you because this has no mechanism. This is all phenomenology. This is all horseshit. And it went further than that. Uh, so can we actually understand those transition mechanistically? And the answer is yes, within the framework of extended evolutionary theory. So that gets us a proposal uh, for the understanding major transitions that is deeply historical. And we also, Jürgen and I, that is, applied this to the evolution of knowledge systems. On a very technical way, one can actually characterize all those energy or transitions or any kind of major transition as the emergence of a new platform. Now, in a more broadly defined sense, but take your intuition from 
the modern world and uh, computing and the platforms in computing as an initial guide. A platform then becomes, and this can be formalized, so we are doing real science here, uh, a platform becomes an environment for the execution of functions that opens up a whole new state space of possibilities. So every one of those major transitions basically opened up a new evolutionary space. And you can think about how, for instance, a theoretical framework within science opens up a major space of exploration and therefore is conceptually a platform in that sense. And of course that leads to subsequent differentiation. Uh, now the question then, uh, and sort of channeling Eric here, not just storytelling and description, but how can we actually mechanistically explain the emergence of a new platform? You don't get it within population genetics, where you just have random variations within a population and you get gradual change. You have some more substantive change. So we have a similar discussion uh, that was triggered within the history of science by the notion of a paradigm by Tom Kuhn. So we are going in those directions here in a theoretical way. Now, the way it works, uh, or can work mechanistically is through that uh, additional dynamic that we have within extended evolutionary theory. So the example is, what is this? You're familiar with it, it's a gadget. Jed had the first one, of course. Um, but it's also, it was a lousy phone when it came out and it still is a lousy phone. So why is it successful? Well, to make a long story very short, it's successful because it's not a phone, it's a platform. And the platform could emerge because something else happened. Namely, the whole long tradition of listening to music while walking around, leading to the iPod. The functional states of the iPod were externalized into a new niche, iTunes. And within that new niche, which was basically a commercial delivery system, you could make the iPhone work even though it was a lousy phone. So that's the short version of how you need externalization and subsequent internalization in order to mechanistically explain how you get a new platform. And this is basically what our theory is about. And then energy transition that we have seen are also platforms. Okay, that's uh, how we try to understand the Anthropocene and the emergence of the Anthropocene. What about surviving the Anthropocene? And here we are dealing with our global futures in the age of the Anthropocene, or the question of whether we have a future. Uh, I don't need to remind anybody in this room about the urgency of the problem. And we are pretty confident that, if we, that we have about 25 to 35 years before it is too late to intervene. So that's a pretty short time frame. Um, sustainability is really only a challenge in the Anthropocene because of course in the course of human uh, history and human evolution, individual cultures went extinct all the time and nobody really cared besides the people who were affected because they were disconnected and localized. Now we have a globalized world and we basically have one shot. An extinction event now will wipe us out. So that creates the kind of the urgency and why sustainability really is connected to the Anthropocene. And responding to that, and this has a lot to do with the kind of knowledge that we need, we need to actually look into the future. And we need to define our present, not from the past, but from the future. That means we need to find a way to accumulate knowledge that allows us to uh, model a project trajectory that might allow us to stay within habitable spaces. And the question is, what knowledge do we need uh, for this dimension of Anthropocene? So this is sort of more programmatic, so I just sort of give you an idea. We work on that a lot. And what comes out here is that you can't do it without history. You can't really figure out where this knowledge should come from without the kind of critical, historical, epistemological reflection about science and about the interrelationship between science, technology, economics, and social systems. Because in order to affect a systems transition of systems that are highly interdependent, highly past dependent, you need to understand that history. <coughs> Otherwise, you're making just blind decisions uh, and you make decisions based on even less knowledge that we potentially have. And this is basically really important, uh, an important role for the kind of history of science that JET stands for and the kind of history of science that we all treasure in this very urgent endeavor. 
There's an additional challenge, and that is how do we actually build the right kind of models? And uh, this creates a new dynamic of knowledge production within science. Because, of course, we are used to build models based on data that we have or that we collect in our systematic way. But in order to, for instance, make an energy transition possible, it's not that we don't have the technology. It's that we don't understand to make it happen within particular social, political, and economical contexts. So we need to incorporate those dimensions into our model building. And so what we have developed here is a framework that is an iterative model development in participatory uh, events where we actually talk to people who are affected by those transitions and try to figure out what makes them tick and what is their behavior. And it evolves some sophisticated computational environments and a lot of toys, supercomputers in that sense. So I do you want better here? We, apply, <laughs> we have different toys here uh, uh, to actually make this kind of thing work. Okay, so uh, to, to sum up here, uh, we have, uh, in order to accomplish these transformations into the future, we need to understand transformations of complex systems that requires a lot of uh, historical information, also historical information about the knowledge that we have and how we understand those systems. Um, those systems are operating on different uh, regimes and different scales, both in space and time. And that requires the kind of technical understanding of what really goes on. You can't cheat because the integration of those different systems is not a trivial matter. And you can only do it if you understand it that accurately in the way JET trained us to understand science. Um, and uh, then, and this is something where we don't have time to talk about, you need to actually mine multiple data sources, which involves the kind of text mining uh, that uh, Jürgen was alluding to, and uh, a modeling framework. So to conclude, here's a question that was framed uh, a couple of months ago in a PNAS paper by Martin Schiffner, uh, and that is a question about coordination. Uh, here it applies to governance for global futures, but you can sort of have a similar version of that as Don alluded to for how we actually govern history and philosophy of science. Uh, how that works is an open question. But you can ask what can evolutionary uh, theory offer? Well, from the point of view of the future, evolution is 3.5 billion years of risk management. So there is something to be learned from evolutionary biology for those challenges. What can the history of science offer? Well, it offers us the necessary perspectives to approach those challenges into the future. Thanks, Chet. <laughs>